guys, we're in the middle of a pandemic and these are trying times. It's hard on our mental health, our mental state. And this is why I love our sponsor today, BetterHelp. They're the largest online counseling platform worldwide. They change the way people get help with facing life's challenges by providing convenient, discreet, affordable access to licensed therapists. BetterHelp makes professional counseling available anytime, anywhere, through a computer, tablet, or smartphone. It's brilliant. Sign up today. Go to betterhelp.com backslash solving healthcare and get 10% off sign up fees. Welcome to Solving Healthcare. I'm Quadro Caramante. I'm an ICU and palliative care physician here in Ottawa and the founder of Resource Optimization Network. We are on a mission to transform healthcare in Canada. I'm going to talk with physicians, nurses, administrators, patients, and their families because inefficiencies, overwork, and overcrowding affects us all. I believe it's time for a better healthcare system that's more cost effective, dignified, and just for everyone involved. Welcome back, everybody. Qualcast Nation. I am jazzed up. Like my jazz hands are up right now, which is weird because I'm just talking to you um, about this episode with Roger Martin. But first, I want to tell you a couple things. We just finished Black History Month, did a couple shows and recasts related to anti-black racism, and it has produced a ton of opportunities to be able to speak to out about this to different organizations. And I just want to say, if you guys are looking for a keynote speaker or somebody to speak on this issue, it's been a true privilege to be able to advocate and and do do my part. So reach out to me at quadcast99 at gmail.com or look at any link at solvinghealthcare.ca. Next, the episode with Dr. Fung and Dr. Tucker looking at lifestyle modifications for, uh, improving your cancer outcomes linked up also with the continuous glucose monitoring episode has been a mad hit, a mad hit. So I just want to make sure that you guys know, go to solvinghealthcare.ca backslash cancer and be able to see the full episode with the Q&A. Dr. Fung and Dr. Tucker hit it out of the park. The feedback's been incredible for real. Okay. I can't tell you how much of a privilege it was to talk to Roger Martin. This guy is a pioneer. I will, I'll go ahead and say this. He is probably one of the greatest minds in terms of how to come up with solutions that you could come across from our nation. Like This guy is brilliant. He's the former dean at the Rotman School of Management. He's won the Global Dean of the Year by Poets and Quartz. He's produced over 12 books in his latest one, When More Is Not Better. Um, this guy is, for lack of a better word, a genius. And the reason I wanted to get him on the show is he talks about how to come up with solutions using integration. How can you learn from other areas of arts, science, sport, and bring solutions to whatever issues that you have at bay? And I like this because... COVID has required a lot of creative thinking. How do we come up with solutions quickly to get us our patients safer and also get us back to normal life? And the frameworks that we talk about on how to come up with solutions, I, I, I get super excited. It might keem, seem a little dry at the beginning, guys, but hang in there, guys. It is stuff that will alter the way you think. These approaches are things that we could be teaching our kids at early ages to think better, to think more critically, and to come up with solid solutions to problems. So without further ado, my man, Roger Martin. Roger, welcome to the show. Hey, it's great to be on the show, Dr. K. Oh, really appreciate you coming. I, I was, I've been giddy about this all day. So <laughs> maybe, maybe Roger, um, how did you get into this concept of in- integrative thinking? Like, what was your path to get you uh, along these lines? Sure. Well, it, it's a, it is a, lo- a long and winding path. So uh, it, it really started uh, in 1991. And in 1991, I was uh, one of the four guys running uh, a kind of startup insurgent uh, strategy consulting firm called Monitor Company in Cambridge, uh, Massachusetts. And um, uh, 
And I was fascinated with the question of why. So we came into existence only in 1983. So we were the smallest of the players, McKinsey, 1920, Boston Consulting Group, 1963, Maine, 1973, us 1983. We were all, all young in our, in our, uh, uh, I guess by, by 1991, all in our like early thirties. And I kept, I sort of was intrigued by the question of why on earth would these firms hire little us rather than big established somebody else? And, and I came to the conclusion that the only thing they hired us for was for problems that kind of slopped messily across boundaries. Mm-hmm. So if it was, they were going to do a Salesforce reorganization, they went to McKinsey who had done 500 of them before and they, they could, uh, uh, they could do that. Um, or if it, if, if it was, strategy in a situation or an industry that it had been done before and you just wanted something like that, they would do that. But if it was sort of a messy problem, like, hmm, this new thing called cellular tele- telephony is coming along, how will that develop in Korea? <laughs> right? Like nobody had an answer to that. You had to think about it sort of from first principles and think about it. Was it just a technology question or a consumer question or, or a kind of a government relations type, type question? What, what would the regulatory start? It would be a whole bunch of things and it would be, it would be messy. And so I, so I sort of came to a, a, a conclusion then that that had something to do with it, that, that uh, not everybody was willing to uh, take a situation where you had to, understand, let's say in Korean, uh, <laughs> the cellular, you'd have to understand some things about the technology, some things about consumers, some things about Korea and Korean culture, some things about finance, uh, some things about a lot of things and somehow come up with a, with a view of how those things are going to unfold in the future. So that just put an idea in my head. Um, and then I started watching highly successful CEOs um, and tried to figure out, well, what was it about them that made them successful? Um, and my, my sort of my, my, my first pass at it was, God, I couldn't, I couldn't tell kind of what, because they seemed to do all sorts of different things. It wasn't a pattern of the things that they, they did. Um, but then it dawned on me that maybe, um, they did different things because they were all in different contexts. So Korean cellular was a different context than whatever Jack Welsh at, at, uh, at GE or Izzy Sharp at Four Seasons. Uh, and so if I looked at what they did, it was too context specific, but perhaps there was a pattern of thinking. Mm-hmm. And so that's when I sort of honed in on that. That was until literally, you know, uh, probably 15 years later. So this is an you know, example of how things take a long time to, to fruition. And so I started studying the patterns of thinking that these highly successful leaders uh, did. And, and interestingly enough, it came back to the insight about why they hired us. Um, and it was, it was that these highly successful leaders, uh, when they faced either or choices, is he sharp, should I build? small roadside hotels, which was the first four season was the four seasons of motor in, if you can, if you can, uh, uh, believe it, 15 bucks a night, uh, or big city center convention hotels, uh, uh, which is third hotel was what's now the Sheridan, uh, uh, and downtown, uh, uh, Toronto. Um, uh, rather than saying I have to pick one of these others, they would use that to spur themselves to come up with a better model. And, and I said, whoa, that's, that's kind of, that's kind of interesting. And I delved more into that and, and came to the conclusion that that was a rare thing. That's why they were highly successful. Like if every executive did that as a you know, cha-cha matter, of course, uh, they wouldn't be successful. It's a rare thing. Uh, and then I spent a lot of time diagnosing it and, and wrote a book. Uh, in 2007 called The Opposable Mind that sort of talked about uh, this being the only thing that I could find consistent among successful successful uh, 
of people. Then I spent 10 years with a bunch of colleagues figuring out, well, how do you do it to create the practice for doing it? And wrote another book with one of those colleagues, Jennifer Rial, called Creating Great Choices in 2017 that said, okay, if you want to do it, here's the steps you take to do it. So it was a kind of long, it was kind of a long, uh, long journey that was spurred by kind of, as I imagine most of these things are by sort of a mystery. I was sort of mystified by something. And when I'm mystified by something, I try to figure it out. I fall in. I, I, I mean, I, I think people will, will see my enthusiasm of how brilliant this is. Like it's intuitive when you say it, but it's not like, as you said, it's a kind of a rare approach. It's because like, so much, so many of us are so used to that. As you mentioned, the either, or it's gotta yep. be, option a versus option b and not looking at the components within a that you would probably want and the components of b that you could maybe put together into a beautiful uh, option c which you know creates wind wins it's like same principles of negotiation um and the reason why i think we really really need to emphasize this especially in the era of covid is because we are very black and white with our approaches it's very as i mentioned it, a or B. And yeah. so, and we're taught that. I yeah. mean, I think, the, I think the important thing to recognize is the degree to which if you put this lens on and then say, okay, what is, what's the main stream of our teaching like vis-a-vis what I've just talked about? And I think it's fair to say the answer is the opposite, mm-hmm. right? There's a right answer and a wrong answer, right? Mm-hmm. And your job as a student is to write down the right answer. So you get a check mark rather than a red, red X and you get the marks associated with, with, uh, it, with that. Um, we're, we're just, we're just taught that we're also taught certainty. Right? Mm-hmm. We're taught that there is a certain right answer and a certain uh, wrong answer. And that's what you, you uh, uh, stick with. And, mm-hmm. and uh, you know, and, and you know it from the medical uh, kind of industry. I often use the, the uh, example of peptic ulcers, right? For literally decades, we had a theory that was right that said peptic ulcers were caused by excess stomach acid. And the, the solution is bland diets. Uh, and if it gets bad uh, enough, you go in and chop out a hunk of the stomach that's ulcerated. Mm-hmm. Uh, Right. And th- that was viewed as right. It was taught as right. It was not taught as this is pretty confusing. And this is the best answer we've come up with uh, uh, to date. Right. And it took uh, Warren and Marshall, the crazy Australians, to literally, you know, Marshall grew himself a, 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 an ulcer and cured it with an antibiotic to, de- to finally get an article published in a medical journal. Uh, because all of his articles were rejected before because he was wrong. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and so, yeah, I, th- I think we're taught that you, that the goal is to get the right answer. Uh, once you get to the right answer, you should defend the right answer against all comers, right? Because mm-hmm. it's right. Mm-hmm. Uh, and you wouldn't want a wrong answer to take precedence of the right answer. Uh, and, and so other answers are essentially we're taught again we're not taught this explicitly it's implicitly we're taught implicitly that other answers are the enemy they're trouble they're a problem they should be defeated they should be brushed under the rug all of all of those those things instead of imagine being taught from an early age like kindergarten um even though this is hard right there are actually very few right answers uh, in, in, the, in the world. They're just better ones and worse ones. Mm-hmm. And your job in life is to get to better answers. And regardless of how good your answer is that you come up with, there's probably a better one lurking out there somewhere. Mm-hmm. Um, and you should have a thinking process that, that, that is forever searching for those better answers. And you know what your biggest friend is in finding a better answer? Curiosity. An opposing model. Yeah, well, oh, yeah. Yeah. Curiosity, so, but it's yeah. an opposing model. But, that's raw materials. That, that's just literally coming on like, you know, if you're, you know, I, you know, I don't know what, you know, kind of 
uh, making steel, you come upon a pile of, of iron ore. <laughs> it's just like, holy smokes, I can make more steel, mm-hmm. right? Because I found this, an opposing model is a treasure trove of different logical structures that are different than your logical structures. And, and what you want to do is, is mine that. So, so think about that. Think about a little five-year-old or six-year, six-year-old coming to school and being taught there are, aren't right answers and wrong answers. The goal is never to get the right answer. The goal is to get a better and more useful answer. No matter how good and useful that answer is, there can be a better one out there. And the best source of finding that is to listen carefully for opposing uh, models. Models that are similar to you are kind of useless because mm-hmm. you're not going to learn anything from them. Uh, but those opposing ones, they're great. And so when you find one, you should embrace it. Uh, if it exists in a person, because models tend to exist in a person's opinions, say, well, what about this? What about the, why do you think that? Uh, what leads you to that, that uh, conclusion? Mine it for everything. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then you would, you would grow up being a, a model builder, not a model chooser. Mm-hmm. And you might say, oh, you know, ha, 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 Roger, you, know, you can't teach five and six-year-olds that. And to be honest, I didn't think you could either. Mm-hmm. But we started teaching, we, we started believing that you could teach high school students that, that they'd have the mental facilities then to engage in this kind of thinking. And, and, and we started teaching teachers and we'd have teachers coming to our, our, our uh, I think sessions uh, who were teaching grade three and four uh, uh, students. And they'd say, you know, my students can do this. And we'd like, I don't know, you know, I'm not sure they're ready for it. And we were like, so wrong. And they were like, so right. Uh, and now it's all the way down to kindergarten, uh, kindergarten kids. And, uh, and they're remarkable. They can do it. Uh, they can do it like falling off a log, basically. Uh, maybe maybe so, even Roger, like if we can think of a, like a concrete example for like, like we have a lot of young healthcare professionals listening to this and they have young families and, and I, I personally love this integrative approach because it it breeds innovation too. Like it, bre- it uses your creative side of your of your 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 brain to be able to come up with solutions that benefit from like like with real creative uh, solutions. So maybe if we could even think of an example, whether any school age kid. How about, how about this know, one? To, how, how about this one? Medical one. Uh, the anti vax movement. <laughs> All right. Okay. And we did this in a, in, a, in a session with a bunch of healthcare professionals. We put that on the table as the, uh, the challenge that there are, there are people who uh, believe fervently, I suspect you're one of them, that, that vaccinating for a bunch of things is, is kind of really, uh, really important. Uh, it's a core public health uh, thing. And this was all long before COVID and COVID vaccination. Uh, but then there are these other people who believe that, uh, you know, your kid will get autism from, uh, from them. And, and, uh, generally speaking, they're, they're, uh, they're, they're dangerous. So we have those opposing, uh, models and, and we have this, this vaccine question. And when we were teaching it, we had one, one of the surgeons in the, in the, in the class sort of say, there is no vaccine question. <laughs> right. So, you know, I don't know why we're using it. There is no vaccine question. And we, and we said, well, well, then why are, why is the anti-vax movement growing? Not, not, uh, uh, not shrinking. Right. And, you know, the, the, the reason is because the vaccination people just say my model is right and I must crush your model mm-hmm. rather than understanding uh, kind of what, uh, uh, kind of what the anti-vax uh, movement is 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 about, and so we we had them tear apart both both models to find out what what mattered about uh, the models and what mattered about the models to to the the, the you know docs tr- traditionally uh, was well. There's strong medical science behind it. What mattered to the anti-vax people was control. Mm, right. It, 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 yeah, it was choice and, and control. 
And and once once uh, once you got there, um, you could imagine solutions uh, that were not the solutions we're contemplating, right? Which is doing what, like reducing choice and control. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we will we will send the police to your door, door and vaccinate you, or you can't bring your kid to school. With, you know, um, so uh, but it was interesting. The reaction was was there is no vax vaccination controversy right right yeah. because a scientific model says says it's settled completely mm -hmm. but the scientific model actually only has some somewhat something to do not everything to do with with the the reality that's out in the out in the world uh world now which is rising uh anti anti vaccine, anti -vaccine. movement no, I, I mean it's it's beautiful. It's a, it's a dissecting where the core issues are from both sides, and to to try and find that mutual solution. Can, maybe you can walk through Roger, like like because you you. It sounds like there are definitive steps for having that integrative approach. Like, are there some steps that are that come to mind to be able to be that any of us could go through to to come up with these solutions? Absolutely. And, and, you know, and not, not to stoop to uh, trying to sell books, but, but I mean, the good news is, is after 10 years of hard work, um, we have a very, very simple use methodology in the second book, the creating great choices. So we're going to promote all of that beautifulness on our, uh, on the show notes, my friend. Yes. So anybody who, who says, oh, Roger went too fast over that or whatever, just just get and, and the and literary charts and everything are there. But so, OK, so step one, step one is is to take the two models and don't allow them to be mushed to the middle. Push them to the ex, uh, to the extreme, because what often happens is in a desire and I'm in a dialogue right now with a scholar friend of mine who keeps trying to do this. He says, no, 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 we're really close together. We're re it's just little semantic. No, 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 that's not how, that's not how you get the most from it. The most is you allow them to be very far uh, apart, right? Um, and so it's, it's uh, vaccination is dangerous and bad and, uh, and risks the lives of uh, our children. Vaccination uh, is, is absolutely key to, to, uh, to public health and any deviation from it uh, uh, damages her immunity to our great peril. Boom. Does, does. Then, then you take each of the models uh, uh, one at a time. And what I say is you fall in love with the model, right? <laughs> you say, I, I love this model. This is awesome. And, and, and what I say, when you fall in love, uh, what happens? Two things. The person in which you're, you're in love with could, is perfect, and, and there's nothing about them that that, uh, that you think is bad, right? Yeah. And you don't think about anybody else, right? That's yeah. falling falling in love. So fall in love with 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 the, the model, and then ask how it works for the various stakeholders in the model. Who's involved in the model? So how does it work for the 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 parent with a, a child making making uh, that choice? How does it work for the public health uh, 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 officials? How does it how does it work for the like you know, their the, perspective? Yeah, the community, the community, yeah. and, and but say how does that model produce the outcome that they are seeking? Right by what mechanisms does it so 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 you know kind of giving complete control uh, over vaccination to the hands of the of the, of the person well for the, the for the parent what gives them is a sense that they can do whatever they want and they're they're in in uh, uh, con, uh, control etc then you go to the then i say forget about that and fall in love with the other model and figure out how that that uh, that model works right? mm -hmm. And, and then, so that's step, uh, you know, kind of first push the models out to figure out how each of them works, fall in love sequentially uh, with them. Then take those two pictures of how those models work and ask, you know, what, what would we love to keep from, from those models? And if you say everything, I say, oh, come on, come on. Well, like if you could only pick 
kind of, kind of a, a, a smaller number. What are the things you'd really, really want? And what are the things that actually appear on both, right? They aren't actually conflictual. The models at, their, at the top of the, 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 the header on them, anti-vax, you know, must vax, look like they're completely incompatible, but what down below might be, might be actually compatible and, and where, and where are the areas where the greatest, the greatest, uh, um, conflict exists, uh, uh underneath. And then it's to, is to try what, what we call integrative, uh, pathways. And we have three integrative, uh, pathways. One is, one is a hidden, what we call a hidden gem. If you could just pick one from each and combine those, could you create a new model? We have a double down. How could you double down on one, push harder on that one in a way that gets you the benefits of, of the other? And the other is disaggregation. Are actually these models both perfect for part of the solution? And, and so we should break the problem set in half and apply the two models uh, uh, to each. So there are sort of what we've learned over time is that integrative solutions seem to come in only those three forms. We've only found those three forms uh, thus, so we give you the forms and give you examples of, of, uh, of those, uh, those forms. Um, and, and, uh, and what we found is, is that you can find integrative, uh, uh solutions. Um, and, and, uh, um, you know, uh, I, I've, I've now have sort of great confidence that anybody over the age of five, at least can come up with integrative solutions if given the tools and, and sort of given a perspective on, on what, what's your goal in, in life. And, and there's, there's a field of thought of it. If you haven't read them, you ought to, you ought to read Karl Popper or, and or Emery Lakatos, who both talk, talk about uh, justificationism and falsificationism. And uh, we are mainly taught to be justificationists, which is we're taught, as I said, that there is a right answer. Your job in life is to go from not knowing the right answer to the right answer and once you've gotten the right answer is to defend the right answer against all comers. And again, if you just think about your education, to think back to all, all virtually all of it is justificationist. And, the, and your grading was, was based on you being really good, a justificationist. A falsificationist says, um, there are no right answers. They're just better ones and worse ones. And your journey should be towards making your answers better and better. And in that, in that uh, world, once you get to an answer that you feel pretty good about, the only thing you should know for sure about it is someday a better answer is going to come along and obsolete your answer. But in the meantime, you should, you should use it. And a falsificationist will look at disconfirming data as manna from heaven. Yeah. You know, that's I mean, the way to, to advance. And so, so, you know, if, if we could just you know, stop putting out justificationists one after, after another, uh, it would be, it would be helpful to the world. Um, Amen. The, um, and I think this has kind of helped us in, in a lot of ways on certain elements of COVID, like having that, open-mindedness, you know, not to have that justification uh, consistently because, we, we, you know, someone like in our intensive care units, we've changed dramatically our approaches to how we're treating our patients. And that's luckily because of having that open mind, realizing that we might not know everything right now and there could be better and greater solutions here. Um, so I'm curious too, like, yeah, I, I, for what it's worth, for what it's worth, I, I, I'm, I'm of two minds on the handling of the, of, of COVID. Um, in my view, um, whenever we had medical people being separated from the practice and, and declaring on policy, we made errors. And whenever we had practice 
dominating, we made advances, right? So when the CDC was proclaiming, no, masks are bad, 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 you shouldn't wear masks, then mask, you have to wear, wear a mask. These are people far from the fray, I think, pontificating. Uh, I think the people in the ICU at Ottawa uh, uh, General, I'd want to ask them, like you're watching people die or not die based on based on you did this versus versus this what what do you think what do you think was going on there uh and so so i i'm 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 a real even though people would think oh roger you're like you write all these books and all this stuff you create theories you're a theoretician no i'm a pragmatist and so so i i would want the the decisions made by people practicing right i i I mean, I know uh, Dr. Fauci and Dr. Burks did the best job they, they could, uh, but I would have rather had Dr. Fauci spending half of his time actually treating patients, clinically treating patients, and half of his time on the task force. Yeah, it's a, it's a very interesting perspective because I, I, you know, here in Ontario, I do wonder how many f- truly frontline people are sitting on some of these committees uh, that are making decisions because sometimes the words coming, <laughs> yeah. Sometimes the words coming out are, are, are I'm like, this is not what we're seeing by the way, like in, in terms of this doom and gloom and, and what we're seeing out of our patients and the outcomes and like, they're not always correlating with what's, what's being busted out in the media and so forth. So yeah, yeah it's a, I think it's a very insightful uh, uh, comment there, Roger. Cause um, yeah, it would be, if I mean, I was a boss, I'd make sure there's some frontline staff in there for yeah. real. Yeah. And it's tough. It's, it's a, it's a tough job. Uh, um, you know, and, um, and I think fewer people actually would, uh, would embrace the job and, and, and because they know they are or aren't good at it. Right. Mm-hmm. You know, the, the, uh, you know, many frontline workers, don't want to step back and abstract from what they've done to say, here's the general trends. They say, I can do that or serve another patient. You want, you want that patient to die while I'm abstracting? No. And so they, so they're, so they're, their, their sense of self and what they want is to say, practice, 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 practice. Then there are theoreticians who say, Ooh, God, I don't want to, I don't want to practice. I don't even know how to practice, but I want to theorize. Right. And then there's a, a relatively small number, at least in my experience, a relatively small number, uh, who, who want to practice and theorize about their practice, practice, theorize some more, practice, theorize some more, go back and forth. And it's those people that you want. So I wouldn't, I would not take you know, kind of a random selection of frontline workers and put them on the committees. Mm-hmm. I'd be looking for the person who wants to go back and forth, who, who says, yeah, I want to create general guidelines that will, ha- that will help people out and go on national TV doing that. But the only way I'm going to feel comfortable with that is if I personally am treating patients because the nuances here in something that's new and different are so, so delicate that I need to understand those uh, nuances. I mean, Roger, I'm just getting a, a crazy epiphany here too. Two, two comments on that. Cause it's uh, one, like I've, I've if, if you probably, I don't know if you know this about me, but I, I do like go on media, like, uh, news to talk about the COVID experience and so forth and and render an opinion. And it it occurred to me that, you know, it's part of the pragmatism from our viewpoint is because as an intensive care doctor, you actually have to use a lot of integrative uh, thinking and solutions because you'll have multiple specialists come up with their opinion on what they think is best for their patient. And you have to think holistically on what's the best approach. Same thing with COVID. And if you they got, don't, they're going to die. If they don't, they're going to die. Like it's not like exactly. the stakes are low or something either. <laughs> but it's the same thing with our COVID decisions. Yes, you could, just as an extreme example, shut down everything in your economy and all that stuff. But you have to ask yourself, what is what is the consequences to that? Is that an acceptable uh, resolution? If you know your kids are you know, not going to be educated, you got delayed cancer surgeries and all that stuff, like that's also part of the puzzle. You know, and um, no, it just uh, 
just really um, made a lot of sense as you're saying that kind of why maybe, um, you know, there, there's that element of pragmatism that we've, a lot of intensivists would have because yeah, you are frontline, but you, but you also know that you have to have a holistic approach. Like you practice that on a daily basis. Um, otherwise, as you mentioned, patients aren't going to survive. They're not going to have the, an ideal outcome. Uh, yeah. I just thought I'd but share you that. Probably, you would probably, probably say that, that probably if you just lined up all your intensivist colleagues, you could probably line them up on the basis of who, who would enjoy uh, abstracting back and saying, here's, here's what I think I would go and go on and who wouldn't. And, and there would be, there would be differences. And are, are the ones who wouldn't bad people? <laughs> no, they're not. They have a, they have a reason, reason, uh, uh, for that. Um, but it was always for, for, for me, you know, it was like, it was always interesting to watch because you, you, you may know enough about my background to know, like yeah. I was, a, I was just a business guy. I was a business guy who Rob Pritchard, the then president of university of Toronto tapped and said, I want to make you the dean of my business school. And I was like, well, I don't know anything about that. And he said, it'll be fine. It'll be fine. <laughs> so I, I went and I I went, went and did it. And, and I would, and I would watch, I, I, I would watch my academics who were great, who were fantastic, who were hardworking and everything. But quite a few of them just didn't ever hang out with actual kind of business people. Mm -hmm. And, and I just kept, kept thinking, how on earth, how on earth can they stay kind of on point with, without, without that? And people, and people often ask me because, because I write so much, I've read 12 books and like 600 articles and blah, 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 blah. They say, you know, gee, how do you get your research ideas, Roger? And, and they're taking this perspective of somehow you've got to sit in your office and get a research idea, mm -hmm. right? And, and, and my reaction is, well, I've actually never once thought about the notion of a research idea, right? I just because I spend a whole bunch of my time consulting to CEOs, right? And, and I just hang out with CEOs and whatever they find out, find is problematic. I think about and write about that's my production production met, met, methodology. And so, so I don't, I don't know how you can be a great theoretician without, without being in, in the middle of practice. Like I, I just, I honestly, I honestly do not know how you, how you, uh, you can. And, and like, I'm getting chills thinking about this because, you know, in my, I'm just, I keep bringing it to this line of work. I apologize, but you know, like no. even within our intensive care, like we have all these incredible researchers that have, that have done, you know, creative, really creative work, but in the land of intensive care, we haven't moved the needle significantly on outcomes in years. Like, is that true? Is oh, that like literally like you're, we're doing studies that, you know, maybe it affects absolute mortality by 2%. And then you do a repeat study and then it's neutral. Then it's like all these kind of like minor tweaks in, 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 in therapies that have not really moved the needle, not made patients significantly more functional or significantly affected mortality. And, but it, now that, as you're saying this, it's maybe it's a little bit, you know, most of the research is also practice intensive care, but maybe the, it's, it's the, I don't know, too engaged into the, uh, into the research. Maybe it's continued to have that same approach to like thinking, because I, I, I've been preaching this. I'm, you know, I, I research, but I'm not a trials researcher. And I'm telling people, we need to think outside the box. Like it's been 15 years before, since we've really looked at p papers that dramatically impacted mortality. And, you know, with technology increasing that we're not, in my opinion, not taking advantage of, we're not integrating other specialties. Like we really need to think outside the box if we're going to move the deal. And the other thing I'll just say real quick too, Roger, yeah, yeah. to your point about the, the, the theor um, theory versus, uh, you know, practical. Um, and, and having that at the table, one of the, I think I, I can't, I still can't believe this isn't a central theme in our COVID discussion. Almost every patient that I'll see in the intensive care unit that's sick from COVID will have type two diabetes or obesity, almost every one of them. Really? And we, we, and we still 
have not talked about an approach to try and mitigate that. And like at a policy level, I don't and like, oh, okay. ima- imagine in Ontario, you're, I mean, you're in Ontario. I mean, over the summer when things were, were really quiet, Imagine saying, hey, guys, we noticed this is a trend in amongst, our di- amongst our COVID patients. Let's promote getting outside, exercising. Think about what we eat. Just reduce your processed food. Like, think, like something, a simple message. And I can almost guarantee you there'd be a significant change in outcomes amongst our COVID patients. But this never gets, like, I, I don't know if this is news to you, Roger, me saying this, but, like, it's, well, I knew there were comorbidities, but I didn't know it was that high. I didn't know it was that high. Uh, yeah, and it's you know medical literature. It's what we see, and never you hear in that kind of discussion. So, I guess what I'm saying is, where you're where you're throwing down really hits home uh, as a as a doc, as a researcher, that really having that element, mixing that pragmat like. Um, the theorism and, and being um, and pra- pragmatism, yeah, pragmatism is so important. And and it's and this sort of leads to yet another thing. And I think I touched on it in in the in the uh, uh, podcast that you re- referred to. Uh, uh, yeah, is 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 this this sort of modern problem of kind of uh, I think sort of abuse of the scientific method, right? Which is oh yes, I love this. <laughs> Which is, which is that, you know, the, the father of science, the guy who really brought the world the scientific method, I mean, it was formalized by Bacon, Newton, Descartes, uh, Galileo, uh, 2,000 years later, but it was really, really Aristotle who, who, whose great interest was in being able to determine what he called, determine the cause of an effect. So, uh, you know, he, kind of, he, he, would, he would say, well, if you, if you look at enough data about a phenomenon, you know, collect it, you can determine the cause of an effect and say, this causes that. And that's post uh, analytica posteriora or posterior analytics, one, probably the most important book in the history of science. Mm. That's, that's Aristotle for 400 BC, bright dude. Uh, and, um, uh, but in the world, went into the dark ages and emerged scientific method, uh, age of enlightenment, and basically has charged forward and said, that's what you have to do. And, and we teach it, uh, Dr. K, we teach it in business school. We say the only good decision a manager can make is a data-based uh, decision. So you crunch the data and make your decisions based on the data. Now, if you go back to Aristotle, He had a different view, right? Aristotle warned, he said, you know what, folks, this method for determining the cause of a given effect is is, uh, only should be used in the part of the world where things cannot be other than they are. So I have to illustrate it with a pen, right? If I have a pen in my hand and I let go of it, it's gonna fall. Uh, It it fell last week, 100 years ago, would have fallen in Aristotle's time, it would have fallen in Greece, it'll fall in Antarctica, it'll fall everywhere. Uh, and that's part of the world where things cannot be other than they are. Gravity will push pens down wherever you are on, on, the, uh, uh, on the earth. Mm-hmm. And so why is that important for the scientific method as we, as we know it? Right? Scientific method says, get a bunch of data, make sure it's a representative sample. You would know from statistics, you took statistics, yes, the data's gotta be from a representative uh, uh, pool, right? You can't take data from only kind of sick people to say, does the, you know, you gotta take a, a representative uh, a pool to predict what the population effect is, right? So if the future data that we don't have yet is gonna be identical to the past data, then using the scientific method works. But what Aristotle pointed out that people ignore is there's a part of the world where things can be other than they are, Mm -hmm. right? Where the future can be different. And in fact, he said quite lyrically in that part of the world, the job of human beings is to be the cause of a new effect. That's what you're trying to do with COVID, right? You're trying to be the cause of a, of a, of a new effect, right? Fewer people dying that would otherwise uh, die from, from, uh, uh, from, uh, so I'm having trouble conceptualizing. So you're saying be the, 
be the the effect you want. So I want to reduce the amount of mortality amongst our COVID patients. And you are not going to do that by analyzing past data. Right. What he said, in that world, you've got to imagine possibilities and then choose the one for which the most compelling argument can be made. Right. And then you go try it. Right. Mm -hmm. As the world, medicine and business has gotten more scientific, it won't try things that aren't proven. I see. Yes. And, and, and what Aristotle said, said was, well, essentially, well, I, my interpretation is, is essentially the minute you do that, right, you only try things that have been proven already, right? You will convince yourself that the future will be identical to the past and take actions that will make the future more identical to the past. Mm-hmm. So, so what I, what I'd say is the only way you're going to get those out of the box solutions, Dr. K is if you imagine a possibility, say, listen, I've been, I've been in there practicing, watching people die, watching some people live, you know, da, 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 da. and I think we could change this by doing the following thing. Mm-hmm. And because we haven't done that following thing, we'll have no data on that following thing. But here's why I think it's a good idea. I've seen this thing in the past over here, this thing over there, this thing over there, this thing over here. And that's why I think this may be a good idea. Let's try it. Yes. And you would be told, bad doctor, bad doctor, you're not being scientific. Try it. Try it. How could, you, how could you possibly say, uh, uh, try it? Yeah. This is not unlike, <laughs> at all, go on day. How, do we, how about we try this? Mm-hmm. A checklist. How about we try this? And my understanding is that that moved the needle dr- uh, uh, dramatically. But it wasn't until you were trying checklists that, that uh, this, this, uh, this moved the needle. So you have to imagine possibility. You have to think about the future that you want. Now, not all ideas about the future are equal. That's what Aristotle said. He, the, the second book that nobody's, nobody's read, uh, I've, I've yet only met one other person who's read, who's read this book in my entire life, a uh, book called Rhetoric, where he explained the methodology for the part of the world where things uh, can be other than they are. Right? And what he, what he emphasizes the degree to which decisions in that part of the world come on the basis of intelligent discussion and argumentation. Mm. Now, rhetoric now has been debased to view sort of, well, that's, rhetor- that's just rhetorical, to be sort of uh, you know, baseless uh, kind of uh, uh, argumentation as opposed to what it was, was an exalted thing in, in Aristotle's uh, mind. So what I'd want to have happen, right, at Ottawa General is, is you get together a bunch of your uh, uh, intensivists who are treating COVID and say, I just want, I just want each of you to come to a meeting, come to this meeting with a, what a breakthrough out of the box thing. You need no proof of it because there won't be proof of it. If there's proof of it, I will, I will exit out as not out of the box, right? There's nothing out of the box. Charles Sanders Peirce, a great American pragmatist philosopher, pointed this out once. No new idea in the history of the world has been proven in advance analytically. Duh. Mm-hmm. So you want to be the first, right? No. So if anybody comes with proof, any of them comes to your meeting with proof, uh, they get booted out because, because that isn't out of the box. So all out of the box ideas. And then you, then you have argumentation. Each of you presents your idea. Uh, you get it critiqued. You get people to build on it. And you come out of that meeting saying, we're going to try these two things. And here's how we're going to try them. Uh, we're not going to risk all patients. We're not, if, if, you know, you know, if something doesn't look, look, look right, we want, but we're going to try these things in order to attempt to generate proof Right, because the problem from a data standpoint of the next six months, the big problem of the na- next six months from a data standpoint, 
is it's in the future. There is no data about the next six months. Mm -hmm. What's the good thing about the next six months from a data perspective? No in six months, there will be all sorts of data, yeah. <laughs> right? Yeah. When, you, you, when you get to look backwards at the six months, it's chock-a-block full of data. And so what you want to do is, is imagine a, a, a breakthrough idea, put it into practice and say, if the breakthrough idea works the way we hope it does, the data will look like this. Mm -hmm. Then after six months, you turn around and look back at that data and say, did it look like that? And the chances are it won't look exactly like that, but if it looks mainly like that, then you'll tweak and, and, and off you go. So that's, that's the exercise I would do, Dr. K. Roger, this is exactly why I wanted you on the show. This is like the beautiful framework for innovation, you know, thinking outside the box, right? Like, yes, you have evidence of, of uh, previous data that's showing that this, uh, X, this solution may be beneficial, but, you, if for you to truly innovate, to move that needle, you need to ask yourself what hasn't been tried and, you know, deduce with your colleagues, come up with, with these, uh, these integrative and, and intelligent and thought, well thought out uh, strategies and say, hey, let's try this. Because I'll tell you, in my profession, you know, it, I mean, I, I, I think I, I feel comfortable saying this. This is that approach is not well received. It it, it isn't, and this is what I mean. Once again, we're tailoring out this show to young healthcare professionals. But them here in this, I'm hoping once again you have that kind of framework and that green light to say, hey, you know what? It is okay to be trying to think about these creative and uh, solutions because I could promise you this all kind of breakthroughs that have come through major breakthroughs that have come through in our line of work is using an approach similar to this. I can almost guarantee it. Um, so here, so you're excited about it. So here's, here's my offer, right? My offer is if you got a group of intensivists of the sort I described, no more than seven more than you, yep. probably, probably maybe five more than you so that you'd have between four and six, in a room and they were given this task of just coming up with one breakthrough idea for how to fundamentally change what we do to serve COVID patients. Um, I'll facilitate the meeting. You hear this? Hear that Quadcast Nation? You hear that offer? I, I don't think we could say no to this. Yeah. You know what I mean? So you get, so you, well, what you got to do is get, get some willing people and, and it'll probably take kind of two or three hours uh and and uh each person will put their put their idea on the table and we will we will discuss it uh tease out the tease out the logic of it and attempt to come out of the meeting with one or two things that you guys will uh will try i you know whether it's covid whether it's liberating from a ventilator whether it's getting people functional out of an icu i'm going to tell you i'm going to be taking you up on this offer roger because i i think even just watch walking through the process i think would be so beneficial to uh to future docs um so roger we're getting to the tail end of this you know you've worked with healthcare organizations what were the what were the key concepts that you taught them? Was it, was it just the general principles of integrative thinking, or did you help them work through some of these solutions? Um, what was that experience like? Well, sure. Like I, I, you know, in many respects, I do most of the integrative thinking work I I do when I'm say on a on a on a board in a more implicit than explicit way, and so uh, when I was asked to join the board of Sick Kids, I'm pretty sure it was 2000. A great man, David Galloway, who used to run Torstar, the you know, Toronto uh, Star organization, was the chairman. And they had a big problem of on the quality committee. And you know how important the quality committee is, probably the most important committee on the hospital board. Uh, and he said, it's just, it's, you know, kind of the, the at, you know, atmosphere is, is terrible. Uh, you know, the board members are sort of into sort of kind of nitpicking and blaming and recrimination. And so the docs don't really want to come. It's, it's sort of like showing up to be grilled and, and uh, uh, kind of, and so it's sort of no fun. They sort of have to, but they beg off as much as they can and, 
leave halfway through the meeting to say, oh, my beeper went off and whatever. And he said, so it doesn't work. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, you know, my, my approach on things like that is to say, okay, right. The board needs uh, uh, some features of, of, uh, of this uh, because that's our, that's our job. The government is, is entrusted in the board, us in making sure there's a quality committee that ensures the quality is high. So we have some, the uh, board has some needs, but all the, the, the docs, uh, who, who come, the chiefs, it was the, it was each of the chiefs and uh, in addition to uh, some, some docs, uh, they come, well, they've got kind of interests, uh, too. One, they've got busy lives. They don't want useless administrivia. Uh, they, they don't want to, they feel badly enough about a kid dying, you know, a, a baby dying in the sick, in sick kids or, or bad results. They take it super personally. It's not like you have to beat them up and say, you should care more about children. I mean, what the hell are you doing in this profession? If you don't like they all, they all care deeply. So, so I just, I just, I just said, well, what, kind of what would get both, right? What would make it a, uh, a, a productive experience for the board members? And what would make it a productive experience for, for, the, for, the, uh, for the docs? Um, and I came to the conclusion that, that sort of learning would be kind of front and, front and center. If the docs actually came and, and and felt that was it, they were learning about something that that would be great, and they would get better if uh, if the board helped them helped uh, create an environment of, of of learning. That would be that would be better. Uh, and so, rather than just having a we'll go through all the problems of quality in the hospital, uh, we had in every every meeting some uh, somebody coming in and presenting nifty things that were done in the world of quality, kind of uh, worldwide. Uh, either somebody internally having gone out and studied that or somebody uh, kind of uh, externally uh, coming in and, and, uh, and I just kept the, uh, the recriminations down to, to an absolute, absolute uh, uh, minimum. If there are tricky situations, I said, let's, hand, and let's handle those off, off offline. Um, and it just became a, 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 I think a joyous experience because everybody always came. Um, the dialogue was, was great. Board members learned all sorts of things about quality from, from both the, the, the people bringing in ideas and then the doctors and the chiefs discussing, uh, discussing it. Uh, and it was sort of a love fest. Um, and quality was better and higher and our practices were more, more uh, uh, advanced. And more engaged. People were totally, totally uh, engaged, and I, I, my hope is that now, whatever, because uh, I, you know, I went off after ten years as, 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 as required. But um, now, now a decade later, I, I hope the quality committee has that same culture, and that people, people uh, see it as a vehicle for learning, sharing ideas, so that we keep more babies uh, alive and heal them uh, uh, faster. Wow! Wow! I, I mean. I'm, as I mentioned, I'm on the board over here. I might be bringing some of those concepts over as well. But Roger, I I can't tell you how much I thoroughly enjoyed this conversation. And I know it might not be intuitive to a lot of our listeners, but this, I'm telling you, if we apply these principles into our field of practice, whether you are a nurse practitioner, physiotherapist, or an upcoming doc, and a future leader, this is what will get, uh, um, really push the envelope within medicine and really move that needle as I've been talking about. So, Roger, as a, the author, former de dean, uh, you know, Board of Governors member at, at uh, Sick Kids, we on Quadcast, we just want to thank you. This has been amazing. Can you tell people where they could track you down? Uh, so I, I do have a website that's organized all my, my writing. Uh, I got convinced to do that a while back. So that's just, it's just www, my name, Roger L. My middle initial is, is uh, L for Lloyd, uh, rogerlmartin.com. If you do rogermartin.com, you will get a, a very pleasant uh, um, uh, car, uh, no, real estate salesman in uh, Houston. Who, <laughs> And forwards things to me. It's very pleasant about it, but it's ro www.rogerlmartin.com. Uh, dot, 
Com. That you'll see everything I've I've uh, written, and you can find your way to my uh, to my books. Amazing, amazing. Thank you so much for doing this, Roger. You are most welcome. Take care, my friend. Quadcast Nation. That was fantastical. You know what I'm saying? Oh man! If you want more, follow us on Twitter, Instagram, YouTube at Quadcast. Leave any comments at quadcast99 at gmail.com. Check out our Solving Healthcare backslash shop to be able to see our online summits, our new merchandise, looking fresh and dynamic. You know what I'm saying? We're all about changing that boogie, yo. And I'm telling you, that conversation today with Roger Martin is all about changing that boogie. So thank you for listening. I can't wait to connect again real soon, y'all. So y'all stay safe and stay beautiful. Peace.